Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Government and business leaders are gathering in Doha for the Qatar Economic Forum. The event focuses on the major economic issues facing the world. This hour, we're going to bring you exclusive interviews from the Qatar Airways Group CEO, the UK Business and Trade Secretary, Plus, Bloomberg's editor-in-chief moderates a special conversation with the Hungarian prime minister. Before we get to that, some breaking news on euro area PMIs. It is weakness in the manufacturing sector. 44.6 is where it comes in. That is well below the forecast of 46 services. That is ever so slightly stronger. 44.9, the forecast, sorry, 55.9. The estimate was 55.5. This continues to be the trend one where we see weaker manufacturing services is the only thing holding up in this European economy. We're going to get more into those figures with our Bloomberg economy editor shortly. Before that, and as we look at any reaction in euro, does look slightly stronger off the back of that, though still down versus the dollar on the day. Some of the risk on posturing in markets has started to fade out as we continue to get through the European trading day. In the very, very early hours, we had a boost thanks to Kevin McCarthy, a House Speaker, saying that they were making progress and things looked good. That spurred a risk on rally. Now that's coming in. European stocks down two-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ futures, those are barely unchanged, but it has been a very strong year for NASDAQ. It's at the highest level, just about the highest level of the year so far. That's happening despite the fact we keep having yields creep higher. I was talking to Steen Jakobsen of CIO Saxo Bank earlier who said that really tech is the only place specifically the AI trade where he wants to be. We've heard that from a lot of folks. There you go. The euro, I showed a pair some of its losses off the back of those stronger um, services readings and manufacturing a little bit weaker. Now, when it comes to all of Europe, again, most regions are lower. Uh, you won't see it on the map, but we are looking at the smaller cap uh, FTSE stocks, UK stocks. Those are in the green, but elsewhere, really throughout Europe, we are much lower on these equity markets. Now, I mentioned the PMI services falling to 55.9, manufacturing at 44.6, missing estimates. For more, let's get to our Bloomberg econ econ economics editor, Zoe Schneeweiss in Frankfurt. Um, Zoe, these numbers, the data show the worst factory reading in three years. What's behind that? So that's very much driven by Germany. German manufacturing um, PMIs also at worst in three years. So just remember that was back in May 2020. So not quite height of the pandemic, but very much an area where we still were, um, where most of Europe was locked down because of this. So um, and here, the, when we look at when we break down and look why, why these people, why, why the numbers are so bad, it's very much that they say there is a lack of momentum coming from China. They were expecting China's um, momentum to then drive German momentum and in turn drive European momentum. And as we know, Germany is very much a manufacturing powerhouse and also the motor of the euro area. So that, those weak numbers are very much a concern. Yeah, it, it, you paint perhaps a grim picture. What does that mean for overall growth then, Zoe? So overall growth, as you mentioned, still is positive. So um, you mentioned services slowed a bit. The overall number also slowed, but it still is a very robust number. It still clearly shows there is growth. So it's a bit of a split, the split picture is obviously quite complicated and difficult to figure out what will happen here. Um, with services also, just a reminder, services then there is um, a lack of, uh, they don't have enough personnel. There also is the issue here that they very much then are driving inflation. So all this just shows a complete kind of difference between manufacturing and services. It's quite startling really. Yeah, yeah, a difference that doesn't seem to be resolving anytime soon. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Zoe Schneeweiss in Frankfurt. Now, European financial policymakers and market watchers are meeting in Brussels today for the Institute of International Finance's European Summit. The Association for Global Finance Industry is looking at how to build sustainable growth after what has been a volatile first quarter. Let's go to Maria Tadeo, who's in Brussels, who's also at the Santander chair, Anna Botin. Maria. 
Yes, and we are joined here in Brussels by Ana Botini, who's the executive chair at Banco Santander. You also chair this conference uh, here in Brussels. Thank you for your time and uh, the invitation. You were on stage and I was watching uh, your conversation. You talked about a lot of issues from growth to regulation. But before we get to that, I want to get your sense of, from your perspective, obviously it's a leading bank, it's, it's, it's a huge institution. How do you see European banks in what has been an interesting start of the year overall for the financial sector? It's great to be here, so thank you for inviting me. Yes, um, you know, I'm chair now of the IIF. Uh, we are very, very focused on how can we make sure that the banks globally continue to be part of the solution as we were during COVID. So what's happened recently, first is, is really the context of we're back to normalization of rates. So we've had very low or negative rates for a long time. That creates a lot of misallocation of capital. You're gonna continue to have bumps along the road. But this is not a systemic crisis. This is not 2008. Global regulated banks have risen the capital levels from two trillion to six trillion. So we're in a very strong position. Banks are resilient and we are now having to work together. We should work together with regulators to see what comes next. And would you say this episode is, is over? And again, a lot of that happened in the United States. There was Credit Suisse, uh, which of course is not a secret. That was uh, the Swiss regulator. But would you say this, this chapter is closed or is there something that still lingers that may worry you? Well, so, you know, uh, 12 years ago, 50% of the financial system in the world were the banks. Today, that's 38%. So a lot of the risk is outside the regulated banks. And we've seen a lot of those instances with the pension funds in the UK, with Arkegos and others, FTX. Uh, you know, there are some banks, regional banks in the US that have a big concentrations on, on commercial real estate. You know, 70% of all the CRE is with the regional banks. So that is something that we should watch out for. But, you know, again, there's a big difference because the systemic interconnected banks are in a very strong situation. And so that is really important for the world economy. And I want to ask you a question I'm curious because we spoke with uh, Jamie Dimon a few weeks ago mm -hmm. and he said something when it comes to the regulation, mm -hmm. uh, there's always been uh, people who, who try to play the system uh, when you look at maybe short sellers and, and who obviously have a vested interest perhaps at times to bring down a name or talk down a name. But he said when you look at social media, tweets, memes, all of this is new. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you go, regulators should look at that in more detail because it is happening and a tweet can create a lot of trouble. I've been saying for many years that we all need private sector, those that understand what is going on with social media, what's going on with the big tech platforms, governments and all of us in the private and public sector and understand what is the regulation we need in the digital age in terms of competition laws, in terms of transparency and privacy, in terms of how these networks are working, where you pay taxes. And so, yes, absolutely, we need to understand how it is that we need to regulate in a sensible way, in a way that allows us to invest in the green transition and the digital transition in a way that allows banks to finance the economy. But yes, we do need a new set of rules. And, and you talk to social media giants at times and go, this tweet was inaccurate, it was proven wrong information and had a severe impact on the stock price. I mean, with money moving in and out. Maria, I am in social media myself. So, yes, uh, what because, do you see? Well, I've seen what happens and I, you know, I've had a, uh, let's say an experience in terms of what it means to tweet on a personal basis. I think it's important because many times you and you know, the media experts look more to the personal than to the institution. And so we need that as a defense. So at some point we might need to come out or I personally as the leader, I don't do it for me, it's work, <laughs> but we do need to be understanding and connecting with the audience and understanding what it means to be in a very interconnected age yeah and then before the start of the conversation you mentioned what is well the key word now for a lot of uh players out there financial players which is rates uh, what do central banks do uh from here uh european central bank and i mentioned the ecb because we're in in brussels yeah. european hours uh, it's assumed that they will hike at least yeah. two to three times more and then stay at a potentially higher for longer uh pace for a bank for financial institutions what does that mean if you assume okay yeah. we're approaching the peak but it will be higher peak for a much longer period of time. So the first thing to understand, and of course we have a lot of experience in emerging markets and inflation economies, high inflation economies. Uh, when your core inflation is five and interest rates are at three, it means you still have negative real rates. Mm -hmm. And that is not, it's not easy to stop inflation with negative real rates. If you owe money, you're still 
like, you know, able to repay quite easily. You have nominal wages rising faster than interest rates and faster than prices. And so at some point, Brazil, Mexico have very positive real rates. Here we still have negative rates. So I think you're still going to see that, uh, you know, we're not, it's not about to change. I think we, we will get stable or even higher rates in the next few years. And, and for you, that's not a problem. It's, it's the way it has to go when you look at the inflation data and you look at the macro data. It's, it's what central banks have to do. Well, so I said this uh, a few months ago, narrow, uh, central banks have a very narrow path uh, to walk on because they want to avoid a deep recession. But what is important is corporates and families, balance sheets are still strong. And so we are continuously surprised by the strength of the economy. If we look at our mortgage cost of risk in the UK, it's less than three basis points. In Spain, less than 10 basis points. You know, again, with negative rates and very high employment, and that's the other key factor, in two thirds of our countries, we are at uh, you know, peak employment. And so that is really what's helping you know, our customers you know, perform well. Now, again, at the bottom, the more vulnerable customers, more companies are suffering. And if we don't stop inflation now, it's going to be a big hindrance on growth. And, and can I ask you, when it comes to also uh, the regulation, there has been potentially out of a crisis not to go wasted, to infuse momentum once again on, while well, completing the banking union uh, in your area. This has been a conversation for as long as I've been alive almost, I think. Uh, when do you think this will uh, come to an end? Will it come to an end? And when you hear we want to create big European champions, is there a number that you think in 10 years we're going to get five big banks in Europe? That's what the future looks like, but get the regulation done. So, uh, first of all, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not heading the IIF, but I was head of the EBF. We commissioned a study, and we have all the data where being prudent, having very strong and stable banks, we could actually liberate up to four trillion of lending in Europe by making some adjustments. So, and let me just give you an example, securitizations. Europe has 6% of the securitizations that the U.S. market has, 6%. Why not open up? And as you said it very well, banking union, we need European deposit insurance so we can have banking union, capital markets union, capital markets in Europe are now down to 10% of the global markets, where 19% uh, 10 years ago. So those are the things we need to get right. And super important, the green transition, because that's a big, huge, huge growth opportunity that we need to get right. And just as a very final question, I'm going to be cheeky and ask you to maybe put the head of Anna Dean, the chair of Banco Santander. There has been many reports that you're out there trying to figure out who's talented uh, at other institutions, reports about credit stories, or you were going there potentially to poach uh, talent, bring the best to your own institution. Are you doing that? Do you have names that you want to get? And do you have names that are already on their way to coming over to your bank. So one of the big success stories, and we, we gave the Investor Day, uh, we gave these numbers at Investor Day, has been our corporate investment bank. So today that is about 30% of Santander's profits. It's been growing. It's a very different model. It's a sustainable recurrent business model based on customers, based around in-market and global scale. And so we're always looking for talent. It grew 30% last year when other- From it, Credit Suisse? No, it was from everywhere. So we've brought people in from all, all the different banks and we'll continue to do that because, you know, we need the best. And if we can attract them, it means we're doing something right. And on that note, you say you want the best. Thank you so much, uh, Anna Botin, for joining us uh, on Bloomberg. It was very good uh, to see you today in Brussels. Usually it's, it's London, today we're in Brussels, but here Thank you, go. you, Maria. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And now back to you. Maria, thank you very much. That was our very own Maria today. Today, oh, they're speaking with the Santander chair, Anna Botin. Now, coming up, we're live at the Qatar Economic Forum. Bloomberg's Manus Cranny will be speaking to the CEO of the Qatar Airways. That's next. Plus, the UK's Business and Trade Secretary, Kemi, ben Kemi Badenoch, joins Bloomberg's Stephanie Flanders. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, the Qatar Economic Forum is taking place in Doha. The event brings together government officials and key business leaders from around the globe as they shine a light on the world's major challenges, 
in the major industries. Of course, air being one of them. Let's take you live to Doha now. A man himself is always on the lookout for a good flight deal. It's Bloomberg's Manus Cranny with one of the most prominent features in aviation. Manus. Danny, thank you very much. Yes, we have one of the stalwarts, the vanguards of the airline industry, the Qatar Airways Group CEO, Akbar al -Bakr. Good to see you this morning, sir. Thank you. A full house. I hope they all travelled on Qatar Air to get here. Well, uh, most of them, yes. Good. That'll be a bump to the profits. Talk to me about the revenge tourism. It's a much maligned phrase. Are you full to the brim? And where is your strongest route? Uh, our load factors are extremely high. We are short of capacity. We need more aeroplanes. And uh, unfortunately, I cannot tell you what is my profitable route because then my competitors will immediately put capacity on those routes. Well, where's your highest capacity? Is it on is it on Doha, actually, London, Doha, at, down to the no, south? No, actually, it is network-wide. If you look at, if you go to the website of Qatar Airways, any flights you will, there will be very limited seats available on those flights because there is such a big demand and a massive shortage of capacity which was brought uh, into because of uh, COVID. And that shortage of capacity, do you think it will be alleviated soon? I know you were at the, the travel market saying, look, I'm going to take deliveries quite soon. How much of a release valve on capacity do you expect? When I say that we are going to take uh, deliveries soon, it is for our expansion and increasing routes and reintroducing routes that we had already stopped uh, during the COVID. Which is going to be the most important route for you to go after again in terms of reopening? Uh, a lot of uh, routes that we had reduced mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, capacity restraint and uh, downfall in demand due to COVID. However, now that uh, we are ramping up, we are introducing new routes in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and of course going back uh, big time into China. How big back into China and how full are the bookings, the forward well, bookings on that? Unfortunately, China is uh, facing problems like everybody else, a shortage of uh, labor, though they have uh, uh, you know, the largest population. But because of COVID, a lot of uh, things changed. Uh, in the labor market. And now it is difficult to ramp up again because of the long time that China was under lockdown. So the ramp up issue for you is a constraint in China, not a constraint in your, on your side, on planes and staff at your side? Uh, yes, there is. On staff side, no, because we are in such a, a, a perfect location that we have a huge labor market available to us around. What is the problem for us is delivery of aeroplanes, and we are not getting them due to the shortage of uh, the supply chain. And here's the point. Emirates are ready to order more planes. I was with Sir Tim just a couple of weeks ago. Ryanair are ordering more Boeing, Boeing and Saudi Air are ordering. Do you think we're going to go into a much more extended supply chain bottleneck again? Uh, Emirates is ordering more aeroplanes because they have a requirement for fleet replacement, in my opinion, because of a large number of A380s. Uh, which, uh, you know, is uh, not the most optimum aeroplane uh, for a fleet, but it's not my business to tell them what they want. Ryanair is doing it as a program of fleet replacement because their current fleet is getting very old. But we yours already is have, we, we have the youngest fleet in the industry, and we, are, uh, we have a huge order book that uh, has to be... Uh, fulfilled by both Boeing and Airbus. And that's the, those ongoing discussions on the 787, the 737 MAX and the 777X. Yes. Um, do you need to order more? If they're fleet replacing, do you think it's timely for you to jump ahead of the queue and order more than you have? Or do you think, Manus, I will settle and see? I think I will settle and see because our fleet is already very young, so we can extend its, uh, its uh, operation further. Uh, and think when there are new technologies that will be introduced for us then to place orders for more aeroplanes. Now, I don't get to travel business class on Qatar Air very often, okay? I will, I will say I'm, I've got another brand. How much demand for business class seats have you got? Other airlines are saying to me, for every one business class seat, I've got three, four people bidding on it. 
How big is the bidding for your business class seat? A huge demand. A business class has uh, more than 95% load factor constantly. And uh, because we have such a premium business class that uh, peop we are the first preference for people to travel. Is there any cracks in that at all? Who's filling those seats? Is it leisure, business, and revenge tourist? Or is it business it, travel? It, no, it is actually leisure and business together. And it has always been that way. Business class is never full only with businessmen. The debate also is this. The era of low fares, I lived in Europe for 30 years, Ryanair, EasyJet, evangelized, commoditized air travel. Is that just consigned to history? I mean, have I just got to get used to 25% more expensive tickets? I think, yes, you'll have to get used to it. But if the capacity comes back, as you've suggested, on replacement fleet, on new fleets, will that materially cap the price rises or cause prices of the seats to drop? People still want the comfort, they still want high-class product, and then people will be prepared to airline that uh, provides that. Now, you're famed for, you know, when, air, when, when airline plane makers don't deliver on time, and you've had some uncomfortable moments, let's say. Tell me this, who do you trust more, Boeing or Airbus? We trust them all, and we also mistrust them all, depending on the situation. Well, if I say it to you then, because you're going to have to trust them pretty hard to get these Boeings in, in, in over the fleet. You talked about more orders to come. Tie that down for the market this morning. Where are you going to expect the biggest deliveries, the earliest deliveries? Is it going to be on the 777X? Is it going to be on the 737? I, I, I think both of the aircraft manufacturers have such a full order book that they both will, uh, will have problem delivering aeroplanes uh, to uh, big customers with the numbers they want. Do products like NetJet and private jet flights, do they, are they snapping at your first-class cabins? No, not at risk? all. Not at all. We, we are a very large operator of corporate jets uh, under the brand of Qatar Executive. And, How's that business doing? Just and put that, some numbers that, around that. That business is doing very good. We have over 25 corporate jets, and we have uh, several on order, including the Gulfstream uh, 700, which is a completely new product that will How be introduced. How big can that business become? The business is big because there are still people that are high net worth who are using corporate jets and they don't want to own their own corporate jets because uh, it is cheaper for them to uh, uh, to take from uh, companies like us. Akbar, great to have you with me this morning. I'm going to have to get used to 25% more expensive, but I have to try it your business class. Please back are all back there with the very latest view. Business class is full, it's booming. And of course, Danny, I've yet to travel private. I think some other people around me possibly have, but not me. Danny, good morning. <laughs> good morning, Manus. Yeah, you need to make a, a few friends around there. I think if you want to, if you want to travel private, take me with you, won't you? Manus Cranny there at the Qatar Economic Forum. Fascinating. I was talking to Neil Sorhan of Ryanair yesterday, who said the era of 9.99 euro tickets that is over. All right, as we head to break, let me give you a quick look at what we're seeing in equity markets. They have turned lower um, compared to the start of the day. Um, ignore that second one there. That should be uh, NASDAQ futures. NASDAQ futures, they are just treading water at this moment. It has been an outperformance of tech, tech trading at its highest level since just about 2022. The euro, it has been weak today. There are fears about growth in Europe, manufacturing turning its worst level in the most recent PMIs in three years. Two-year yields, those continue to chug higher. They are over 4.3% at this moment. Some, full, some uh, bullish speak from Bullard as well. Coming up, we're back in Doha with a conversation with hung Hungary's Prime Minister. This is Bloomberg. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Let's get your first word news now. And President Biden says he and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy had productive talks and agreed that a U.S. default is off the table. The two met at the White House for over an hour but have still not reached a deal. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned it's highly likely her department will run out of sufficient cash in early June. McCarthy says he expects to speak daily with Biden until a deal is sealed. I felt we had a productive uh, discussion. 
We don't have an agreement yet, but I, I did feel the discussion was productive in areas that we have differences of opinion. Uh, we're going to have the staffs continue to get back together and uh, work on base some of the things that we had talked about. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has won the support of a nationalist rival, boosting to his bid to extend his rule. The long-shot third candidate, Sinan Ogan, has asked his supporters to back Erdogan in Sunday's runoff. Ogan was eliminated from the first round of balloting, with just 5% of voters backing his candidacy. Erdogan led the earlier vote, but fell short of the 50% majority needed for an outright win. A panel overseeing the credit default swap market has ruled that the government-brokered takeover of Credit Suisse does not constitute a bankruptcy event. Declaring UBS's acquisition of its small arrival a bankruptcy would have triggered an insurance payout for CDS holders. The same panel last week ruled against a similar question related to the write-down of Credit Suisse's AT1 bonds. Two Fed hawks see the need for more rate hikes this year, days after J Chair Jay Powell signaled a pause in June. St. Louis Fed President James Bullard said he's backing two more increases, while Minneapolis Fed's Neil Kashkari says a pause does not mean the tightening is over. Their comments bolster the case that they might skip a move next month while keeping the door open for further hikes. And Adani's group Port Unit is one of the first 10 entities it owns to recoup all losses triggered by Hindenburg Research's short-selling report in January. The conglomerate shares are rallying after a probe by an Indian court panel found no conclusive evidence of stock price manipulation as alleged by Hindenburg. The investigation continues. And that is your Bloomberg First Word News. We have more PMIs hitting the tape. It is UK manufacturing PMI coming in at 46.9. That is a miss. The forecast was for 48, so more weaknesses in manufacturing. When it comes to services, that also is slightly weaker than expected. That has fallen to 55.1. The forecast was for 55.3. But again, we continue to have this divide where manufacturing is exceptionally weak throughout Europe. For much of Europe, it has to do with the fact that Chinese data, Chinese support hasn't been there. Um, Surfaces, you still have a consumer that is doing well. Um, and that's why you see this divide. It really is the services that are helping to hold up what we're seeing. Now, as we debate the global economy, it is a topic that is being debated at the Qatar Economic Forum. Let's take you back to Doha, where Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabazaja is joined by the co-owner of one of the most famous NBA teams, uh, as well as a lot other on his CV, Jen. Yeah, hi Danny. I'm joined now by Stephen at Paliuka. He's the co-owner of the Boston Celtics, and he's also a senior advisor at Bain Capital Private Equity. Steve, thanks so much uh, for making the trek over here to Qatar to speak it's with us. It's a, it's a big time for, for you and the Celtics, as Danny mentioned, one of the biggest NBA teams. Uh, talk to us about, uh, we're approaching the offseason, what is it that you're anticipating in terms of investments and potential changes you might need to make in the offseason? Well, we don't really talk about that at all until our season is over, and right now all the focus is on how do we beat Miami? I'd like to see a win tonight. Um, it's, a, it's been a very tough series for us, and we haven't shot well. Uh, but all the focus is on how do we beat Miami. Right but the now. Celtics are a, a very talented, very experienced, uh, but very expensive team. So, so I imagine that you as a co-owner are thinking about uh, some of this, right, going into the next season? Well, again, again I, I don't want to use the old cliche, one game at a time. Yes. We're really thinking about how do, how do we win this game. And then we'll sit back and reflect in the offseason. We have a fantastic uh, staff, fantastic uh, co-owner with Grosbeck leading the charge, and we'll figure out what our next steps are as soon as this season's over. But we've had a fantastic season, and uh, hopefully we can make history and, and win four in a row here against Miami. Miami's playing very, very well. Uh, fantastic job they're doing. We just got to hit some, hit some shots and hopefully the ball will fall in for us tonight. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, have to see how that pans out. Steve, we're also, you and I are going to speak tomorrow on a panel talking about global sports and really the role that we're seeing sovereign wealth play, institutional uh, funds play. Do you think this is all good, can, uh, all of this money that is flowing into global sports? Is it good for the fans? Is it good for, for the investors? I think it's great for everybody. Uh, sport programming, especially the global sports like, like soccer, size football, and, and the NBA uh, are really one of the few things left where it's must-see TV and aggregates a lot of eyeballs. So live sports programming is a crown jewel of most broadcasters' uh, uh, empire. Um, and so the rights have been going up. 
uh, what's really happened, we, we, we bought the team about 20 years ago, and 20 years ago there wasn't streaming, uh, they, they were basically, basically was on cable and regional cable. The whole world's changed now, the sports have globalized, and the technology has changed it dramatically, as you're seeing on Twitter, Facebook, all the social media, Instagram, so sports has become central, and it's one of the few things that can attract hundreds of millions, if not billions of fans when you when you look at the World Cup and you look at the Premier League, Serie A, all the soccer teams, the NBA. The NBA was actually very early in globalizing. I know David Stern was criticized by many for coming to Europe and Africa and all the places uh, 15, 20 years ago, but now that's really borne fruit and there's over a billion dollars of revenue coming in from uh, international rights for the NBA. Do you, do you think that is contributing then, all of those factors that you just mentioned, to skyrocketing valuations that we're seeing? Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, uh, television revenue has gone up five or six fold um, and is expected to go up again now because of, of the voracious appetite for this programming. But, but how will then that affect who's actually coming in and, and buying some of these teams? As we mentioned, we're in Qatar, uh, which uh, this country is considered uh, buying a, a team in and of itself. I mean, what do you think, from a, from a sports fan perspective, what that, that's doing? Well, I don't really think it, it affects the fans as much. Uh, uh, the more that's invested in the sport, it's better for the fans. Uh, the NBA is pioneering looking at uh, uh, 3D uh, you know, applications, uh, how you have a better fan experience, different television angles. You can get the you can get the you can get different views from the baseline, so you're seeing this technological revolution powering the, the fans, and then in stadium is also incredible with giant drum, jumbotrons, and there's not there's not a dull moment. If you went to a Celtics game uh, 25 years ago, there was dead silence at the quarters, and people would you'd hear a buzz of the crowd talking. Maybe there was an organ there. Now it's non-stop stop activity. So both. On television programming and in, in the stadiums, you know, there's been great technological change, and it's been a great, great experience for fans. And fans can get closer to the players because they can communicate directly through Twitter, Instagram, and all the social media that's out there now today. All right, Steve, thank you so much uh, for your time. Steve Paliuka joining us. Uh, he's also, as we mentioned, or as we forgot to mention, a Syria uh, co-owner as well of the Atalanta. So uh, a lot of uh, sports ownership here with Steve Paliuka. Uh, thanks so much for thanks your time. So much. Uh, Danny, back to you. Jen, a fantastic conversation. What a great, great tee-up for the Miami game. Jennifer Zabazaja at the Qatar Economic Forum there. All right, let's get to some of your top corporate stories with the Bloomberg Business Flash. J.P. Morgan is set to gain an even bigger boost from rising interest rates thanks to its purchase of First Republic Bank. J.P. Morgan has raised its guidance for net interest income this year to $84 billion. That's up from $81 billion. But the lender also sees second quarter revenue from trading and investment banking to each slump 15% from a year ago. First Citizens has sued HSBC for allegedly raiding dozens of employees from Silicon Valley Bank as First Citizens was taking over the failed lender. The complaint filed in a California federal court accuses HSBC of poaching 42 bankers and misusing SVB's confidential, proprietary and trade secret information. HSBC's spokesman declined to comment on the lawsuit. Mizuho Financial Group is forging further into U.S. investment banking through a $550 million deal to buy Greenhill. The Japanese giant will pay $15 billion a share in an all-cash transaction. Shares of Greenhill climbed 116% at the close of U.S. Monday trading session. Mizuho plans to complete the transaction by the end of the year. And that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Let's get a quick read on where we are in this equity market. It has been not the best day. It has been a down day despite the fact we had a risk on boost to start the day, despite the fact we had a really strong U.S. session when it came to tech yesterday. It is the story of tech being the haven. Tech and AI being the safe trade where folks want to high out as we're uncertain of this economic environment. Now, speaking of the economic environment, we have had a whole host of PMIs come in for the most part. PMIs, when it comes to manufacturing, have been weak. In the UK, it was a miss for manufacturing. In Germany, it was a miss too. So there's that concern of China and its ability to really support this economy. All right, speaking of the economy, let's take you back to the Qatar Economic Forum. Bloomberg's editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, is in conversation with Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Take a listen. Um, the basic issue with Ukraine, it's a sovereign country that was invaded by Russia.
just as you might say, Hungary was invaded by the Soviet Union back in 1956. I just watched a video last night. Your great heroes were people like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and John Paul II, who supported Hungary during that. Yesterday, your foreign minister said you would block the aid that the European Union wants to give to Ukraine at this particular time. And I wonder how you, a country that is, you know, you have been invaded by Russia, you know what that is like, why you do that? First of all, thank you very much for the possibility yeah. to have the conversation. Um, one small uh, additional remark. 17 years in power and 16 years in opposition. <laughs> that's, that's equally uh, important. Uh, anyway, um, on, uh, on the war issue, you should know that, uh, that Hungary has a very unique situation in this whole war because Ukraine is not a country far away. Ukraine is our neighbor. Second, we have um, minorities, ethnic minorities living in Ukraine, 200,000 something. Yes. And they are part of the war. They are conscripted as soldiers to the Ukrainian army, so, and they die. So we lose lives daily, Hungarian lives as well. So therefore, uh, we consider this whole situation from a special angle. So we do not belong to the mainstream European approach. And um, my position was, uh, or the position of Hungary was, uh, the very first uh, moment that uh, this war is the failure of dip diplomacy. It should have never happened, that war, outbreak. So, uh, uh, looking what's going on on the front line, for us... The Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban there speaking with Bloomberg's editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite. We will return to that conversation. But first, Stephanie Flanders, head of Bloomberg Economics and Government, is in Qatar with a senior UK government minister who is visiting the Middle East to boost trade. Stephanie. Well, thank you very much. Yes, Kemi Badnok, who is the, Badnok, is the Secretary of State uh, for Business and Trade in the UK. I guess we should start by asking you uh, what you plan to achieve here. I know you're on a mini tour of the region. Yes. Um, today I'm at the Qatar Economic Forum, of course, so thank you for, for hosting. But uh, actually this is all part of a week-long visit to the Middle East as part of our free trade agreement uh, with the Gulf Cooperation Council, which we are negotiating. So this is a region where personal contact is absolutely critical. I need to meet my uh, trade and business counterparts. And a lot of the stuff that we are doing actually relies on getting to know who the people that we are uh, negotiating with, understanding what their concerns are. So it's, it's, um, it's one of my department's five priorities, just signing high quality trade deals, which should help us drive exports, uh, get lots of investment into the UK. We want to be the top investment destination in Europe. And, and that's why I'm here. And we're going to be talking about, we actually have a panel later on yes. uh, about the structure of trade and how the world's changing. But of course, the Britain's biggest trading partner right now is and for the foreseeable future is going to be the European Union and there's lots of concern as you know among car manufacturers in particular about what the impact of implementing the rules of origin uh, full rules of origin will be uh, so how can I just ask you where you are in negotiating um, some kind of fix to that so the uh, the EU you're right is our largest trading partner we have a free trade agreement with them but the uh, terms in which we uh, wrote rules of origin conditions don't work now with rising prices of components. This is not a UK problem. It is a, an EU-UK problem. It works both ways. So both sides are actually interested in looking at what we can do in order to resolve that. The trade and uh, uh, continuity agreement is up for review in 2025. We're looking to see what we can do in advance of that because, as you know, there are lots of global headwinds that are affecting the car industry, which means that this is an issue that needs resolution sooner or well, later. Well, it's just are we looking for a short term fix then before 2025, extending the transition arrangement? Um, so, when, when we make a final decision, we will announce. We're still in the process of negotiating and discussions with, with our counterparts. But uh, what I would want to say to car manufacturers is that we're very alive to this issue. We have been looking at it long before the story. Uh, the most recent story with Stellantis broke. This is something that um, officials and ministers have been working on a long time.
and with our international partners soon. We should see a, um, an answer soon. And will it be rules of origin? I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of features of the trade and cooperation yeah. agreement which have been put off, <coughs> not been fully implemented, which always somewhat suggests that uh, it was not a great trade deal to begin with. I just wonder whether, if you were still trade minister in 2025, would that be your priority for fixing rules of well, origin? It's what ev else? Every agreement needs constant improvement and updating. There is no agreement that is perfectly fixed in time. That's why many of the uh, free trade agreements which we're negotiating are actually upgrades to existing ones. This, as soon as something is written down, the world changes, things move on. So, no, I don't accept that this was not a, 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 good, a good agreement. What we do know now is that the world has changed from when, when we signed that. If I had written a trade agreement in 2016, it would not have lasted for uh, 2019. It would not have lasted for the pandemic if we'd done one just then, and, and so on and so forth. And look at what's happened with Russia, Ukraine. Quite a lot of the things which we had put in place uh, just don't work given all the things that are happening in the world. And what we need to do is to be nimble and respond as quickly as possible. What we have known for a long time was that the car industry was moving towards electric uh, electric cars. Yes. And uh, as you know, there's enormous concern around the lack of scale for battery production in the UK mm. and uh, being, in, in effect, caught in between the US and the U EU on this. How important is it that Tata chooses the UK, not Spain, for its battery plant? And, and ha what are you doing to, to Well, uh, we, we, want, to we want as many people as possible to invest in the UK. The transition to electric vehicles is one that's happening globally, in particular in, in, in the West. We have known for a long time that these things take time. You can't just uh, sprint up a battery factory uh, in a matter of months. And it's all about making sure the supply chain is there and it's integrated with um, the manufacturing sector as well. These two things go hand in hand, but also with the supply of critical minerals. So it is very important that we continue to attract investment, whether it be Tata, we have um, a gigafactory in Sunderland with Envision. We want to make sure that they stay that they stay here and, and that we have the right incentive package for them to do so. What the Chancellor has said and what the Prime Minister has said is that we're not getting into a subsidies race. If you have a subsidies race, someone's going to lose our jobs to make sure that the UK doesn't lose. And we need to have a package that is right for our economy and the industry. Are you still that, fighting um, for Tata? Or because we, we, we hear that they were perhaps leaning towards Spain already. There, so. there, there are always rumours. There are always rumours. You haven't the given Spanish, up. How the, important the, is of, it? Of, 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 I, I just answered. Of course, it's, it's extremely important. But as, uh, as you know, it's a lot live negotiation. Tata will make its decision. We're doing everything we can to show that the UK is the best place for them to invest. They have a long-standing relationship uh, with us. You look at JLR, you look at um, uh, the steel factory in the Steelworks Academy in Port Talbot. We have a strong relationship with Tata. I was in India just a few months ago. We have a free trade agreement which is going to benefit, uh, that we're negotiating, which is going to benefit them. So we're doing everything we can. But negotiations are still ongoing. On the India trade deal, I and mean, obviously one of the things that the Indians are concerned about is improving uh, the conditions for, for visas, making it easier for skilled Indians to get visas. Mm. That's been a stumbling block. Obviously, the, the, the politics around migration extremely hot yes, at the and moment. It's, and so it's really important that we separate migration from mobility for business. They're not the same thing. We don't deal with migration as a whole in free trade agreements. There's, there's, it's only really business mobility. And it hasn't been a stumbling block. It is just one other thing that needs negotiating. If all these things were easy, we wouldn't need this them. This year? Is it going to happen this year? Agreements. I'm not giving a date. Previous, people, uh, previous ministers have given dates, and then the political environment and the economic environment have changed that. It's about the substance and about the deal, uh, not the day. And so what I'm working on is making sure that we have a high-quality deal for the UK. OK, the last question. Are you worried about... There are a lot of senior business leaders, Dyson, uh, from different industries, talking about Britain as not being open for business, mm. about worrying about the climate, worrying about the government's approach to business. I heard, How yes, are you, I heard, who are you talking to? How are you trying to confront them? So I am meeting at least two CEOs uh, a week uh, for very large companies, for team 100 companies. They are saying different things. What... Um, uh, James Dyson says it's very different from what the CEOs of banks say. They do worry about the global economy and they want to know that the UK is going to continue to be a stable place uh, for them to invest. There are uh, some incidents, for instance, the Microsoft Activision uh, ruling that came from the CMA, which they complained about. I don't think that's actually a sign of the UK not being a good place to do business. 
that was a ruling that was made because it impacted competition and it didn't look like it would be good for consumers from our regulators' perspective. So we need to look at all of those things in the round. But we are um, having good conversations with business. We're uh, making changes such as the Chancellor's Edinburgh reforms. We're looking at um, encouraging listings in the London Stock Exchange. But we're, we are open for business and we have a good relationship with them. Secretary of State, Kemi Vaidenot, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Stephanie Flanders there, head of Bloomberg Economics and Government. Thank you so much for that conversation. All right, let's take you now back to Bloomberg's editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, who's currently in conversation with Hungarian and, Prime Minister uh, Viktor Orban. Leadership means that we are led by institutions and the job of the politicians to, to, to operate properly the institutions, which is a nice idea anyway, when everything is going well. But when there are difficulties, it does not work. Institutions are not helpful. We need leaders, human beings, who make decisions, take the responsibility, and so on and so on. So now we are living in difficult times, and the European Union does not have that kind of leadership. But British leaders spent years complaining about the bureaucracy of Brussels, the blob, as some people called it. Surely you're in the same position as that. Yeah, the bubble is awful, yeah, in Brussels, in fact. So we are, it's, the whole, the, whole, um, uh, the whole life of the uh, of, uh, European Union is over-bureaucratized and over-centralized, no question of that. You mentioned decoupling, and I've seen you've done a, a number of deals with China, and to, I'm going to try and generalize for the audience. You know, you have tried to take slightly the same attitude with China as you have done with Russia, that rather than being part of the Western side, you want to be one of the leaders of the rest. You want to be one of the people who is trying to link China and the West. No, no, is, that, is that a reasonable way to look at it? No, we don't have that ambition. The, the reason is that connectivity is a good thing. We have 10 million people. Uh, the export is 80, 85 percent of our GDP, so we are a very open country. And we need commercial and trade and political connections. So believe, we believe connectivity. So China is a huge opportunity. Why we should miss it? As many people would argue, because China could be the long-term opponent of the West. Or partner. Or partner. I, it's our that, decision. That, that may be, very quickly, that may be an area on which you disagree with Donald Trump, for instance. Probably. Let's, let's wait him come back and discuss it. We'll come back to American politics at the end. Um, I, I, I wonder if the applause is for the idea of Donald Trump coming back or for the idea of him not coming back. Understandably. <laughs> um, uh, Yesterday, to come to what you're doing here, you signed an energy deal with Qatar for the purchase of gas, and you said it's always better to stand on several legs than just one leg, which was presumably Hungary's, a reference to Hungary's reliance on Russia for gas. Um, can you give us any idea about what will come as part of that deal? How much gas you will know, you get from Qatar? The, the negotiations are still going on, first of all. Second, uh, Hungary is a landlocked country, which means that we cannot, uh, we cannot neglect uh, the energy coming from Russia by pipelines. Uh, so half of the Hungarian uh, uh, needs uh, of energy are coming from Russia, long-term contracts. And the other half, we have to find other partners. So we are looking for partners all around the world, and Qatar is a, is a potential partner for us. But you know, everybody's queuing at the door of the Qataris, so it's not easy to, to get there and to sign a deal. But uh, even if we are able to do so, uh, it could start not earlier in 2006, sorry, 26, uh, because till then the Qataris are uh, fully uh, occupied by. So, we hope that we can cooperate. Qatar is a, is a country which we respect very much. Without them, Europe would have been in trouble last year. Uh, and we try to build up a more strategic cooperation with them, not just energy, but at the same time agriculture, IT, uh, uh, and basically uh, some security issues as well. Do you think you will get, um, there's talk in Budapest that some people think you will come to, you'll get the Qataris to help you buy back the airport in Budapest, which you have, you have been looking at? Yeah, yeah, Hungary, the main value of Hungary from, from your point of view probably is the geographical position, because we are in the middle of Europe, in the middle of uh, Central Europe, and all the roads are running through Hungary from north to south and east-west. Uh, airport has a strategic importance for us. 
Qatar is are in, uh, interested in. There is no decision yet. We are still negotiating. We would be happy to welcome them. They are still there in Hungary as investors. So you would, you would like to get you would like to get Qatari money to help you buy back if you as, as uh, an investor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but uh, we are ready to be involved as well. So uh, strategical investments. What we need in Budapest in the airport. It's not just to buy out, but to have a big uh, scheme to develop it as one of the competitive uh, airports uh, in the European market. Your critics would say that on getting rid of that tie with Russia to do with energy, you have been perhaps slower than others. You've done deals with Gazprom and things like this. Just as an example, you still have Russia's state nuclear company, Rosatom, building your nuclear power plant. Um, by any measure, it's not going particularly well, partly because of sanctions and so on and delays, surely that is a place where you could just drop the Russian company and get a move on. Well, you know, um, so we, are, we, are, we are not as, uh, we are not in hurry in that respect. In Hungary, back to 60 years, we have a Russian technology-based uh, nuclear power station, which is functioning very well. And the Russians were always uh, reliable partners. And we would like to enlarge that nuclear power station. And to enlarge by a different, based on a different technology, is very risky. So if we would like to enlarge on the same site, we have to use the Russian technology. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Elusive agreement. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says he and President Biden had a productive talk but haven't yet reached a deal to avert a debt default. Hawks rebuttal. The Fed's James Bullard and Neil Kashkari say more hikes could be needed this year, days after Jerome Powell signalled a pause next month. Plus, the Qatar Economic Forum kicks off in Doha, where we'll be speaking exclusively with global leaders in business and in politics. This hour, we hear from the CEO of TikTok. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Ongoing, ongoing debt conversations in Washington. We're still not there yet, Kriti, in terms of getting a deal. The mood music might be a little bit better, but no deal yet. Add to that a little bit of hawkishness from Fed officials. Yeah, and I would say that reassurance from lawmakers that don't worry, we don't know how we're going to get that deal done, but we will indeed get it done. That seems to be at least the one thing that they can agree upon. But Anna, when you look across Wall Street, essentially the estimates here of just how far the debt ceiling uh, kind of trigger could be goes anywhere from June 1st to June 15th. And that really varies based on the bank that's making those estimates. But Anna, to your point about this kind of uh, stalemate that you are seeing in Washington, well, showing up in futures yet again, it feels like every day, day in, day out, we check futures right at the start of pre-market trading and they are mostly unchanged. Uh, That's the similar story you're seeing today, 4201 for S&P futures, but technicals matter here because 4200 is now the new round number to keep an eye on when we look at those contracts. So really keep an eye on what kind of resistance you're going to be seeing from that level. The two-year yield also continues to surprise, 436. And this is where that hawkish rhetoric, Anna, really comes into play here. As we see the likes of James Bullard, who's kind of seen as being ahead of the pack when it comes to kind of his outlandish takes that sometimes uh, come true, and more often than not, 436. 36 on that two-year yield, starting to see a little bit of those yields creep higher by about four basis points. To see that kind of movement at about 5 a.m. New York time is pretty significant when, again, you talk about just what is getting priced into the market. As those yields climb, the dollar follows. A lot of this is coming, though, from uh, both weakness you are seeing in the Japanese yen, but also strength you are seeing in, in uh, the cable rate. So you are seeing a little bit of a tug of war when it comes to the FX market, something we're going to dive into in the Asia story in just a moment. Right now, the Bloomberg dollar index unchanged. But gold, I'm swapping out oil for gold. Gold, Anna. I'm sure you'll hit oil in a second, but gold at 1959. If you are worried about a debt default, you are likely to see a bigger jump into gold. And we saw that for a couple of weeks before we retreated away from almost hitting those record high levels, down by six tenths of 1% on that precious uh, metal. A quick check on those Asian markets, though, because you are seeing some weakness when you look at the Nikkei, down by four tenths of 1%. Their first down day after an eight day winning streak. That's going to be significant 
not just for the Japanese markets, but for the South Korean market as well. The top X uh, is, is something you want to keep an eye on, and the Kazdaq as well over uh, in South Korea. Uh, the dollar you want story, the offshore you want, you are again seeing some weakness there. Of course, as the PBOC really tries to say, look, we are going to stay calm. We are not going to kind of spook the FX market. No averse signals. 706 on the offshore rate. Strength, though, in the dollar had to tune of two tenths of one percent. Of course, iron ore, when you're talking about that Chinese recovery, iron ore is going to be very significant in terms of that trade right now down about 2.7 percent on concerns that the Chinese recovery Anna is just not coming fast enough. Yeah and certainly this time yesterday we talked about some of those mining names being under pressure as a result of the few days of weakness we've seen on the commodities front. This is the picture across Europe then uh, Chrissy. We've got European stocks under a little bit of pressure but actually it's quite a divergent picture across European markets. The FTSE 100, some of the northern European markets and the Spanish market looking pretty flat. Elsewhere a bit more weakness. The Spanish, the uh, French market sorry down by just over 1%. So we've got some weakness coming through in some of these areas of Europe. Let me show you some individual stocks and some other macro themes that we're tracking today. A big focus on financial services services today. Julius Baer down by 7.4% over in Switzerland. Uh, the wealth management business not getting the benefits from the collapse of Credit Suisse that perhaps some in the market had expected. And so that stock is down, as, he, as I say, by uh, more than 7%. Societe Generale, this one just a sort of diary event to mark, but it is seemingly having an impact on uh, the stock because the share price is about performing the rest of the banking sector today. The French bank up by 2.3% as a new CEO comes into the business, nearly 15 years or so with the uh, uh, former CEO. So that is a big change over at Societe Generale. The pound is down two tenths of a percent. It was down actually more than this uh, a little bit earlier on this morning. And we've then seen some data coming out around the UK. And we continue to be in negative territory on the pound. It's interesting because the data, yes, it pointed to a little bit of a pullback in the services sector. But the services sector is still quite strong and a lot of concern about the stickiness of the inflation impulse in services. So how does that add up to expectations around the Bank of England? Well, Market, who published those PMI figures, certainly suggesting we will see further hikes from the BOE. And Brent Crude, you're right, Chris. I did include Brent and we've got uh, that particular price down by three tenths of a percent. But I just included it as an excuse really to talk about what we heard from the Saudi energy minister who basically issued a warning. Watch out, he said, to those who speculate on oil prices. He said we surprised you back in April with that cut to production. That was a surprise for the markets. And uh, there is a meeting coming next week. So who knows? Will we get another surprise, Chrissy? Yeah, a dire warning coming out of the folks over at OPEC. And I would say a similar warning coming out of Washington, at least one whether they're saying don't worry things are going to be okay. President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy remained without a deal on the debt limit last night after another round of talks, but the speaker still remained optimistic. I felt we had a productive uh, discussion. We don't have an agreement yet, but I, I did feel the discussion was productive in areas that we have differences of opinion. Uh, we're going to have the staffs continue to get back together and uh, work on base some of the things that we had talked about. Joining us now, waking up early for us, Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government joining us from Washington. Jack, how close are we to kind of hammering out the details here? What are the sticking points? Well, nothing's agreed to until everything's agreed to, so there are still a lot of sticking points. They're talking about spending caps uh, and spending cuts. There's still an insistence. Uh, that the Republicans want cuts to discretionary spending, the government funding bills that 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 the Congress does every year. The White House said maybe they could freeze spending and agree to something along those lines. Republicans have said, no, it needs to be spending cuts. They're still talking about how many years of spending caps would then limit the growth of federal spending. Uh, they're still talking about stricter work requirements for things like SNAP nutrition aid. Um, energy permitting is still a, an issue that doesn't seem to be as much of a sticking point, probably as just the spending ca uh, cuts and caps. Um, but really, they they you know they can't lock any portion of it in until they've agreed to a, a an overall deal. Uh, the good news, though, is that they seem to be expecting something in the very near future. They're they're postponing other work that Congress was supposed to do on other bills uh, today. So it, it is possible that things come together very soon. Uh, but there are still a number of sticking points that that nothing's really uh, carved into stone on this deal so far. OK, so nothing carved into stone, even if the framework of a deal perhaps is in sight. We will see whether we actually get that uh, nailed down. But even when it is, Jack, if it's nailed down by those in the room, it has to be sold to lawmakers more generally. Talk us through the timescales. What time is available and what time would be needed to get uh, Congress approval? 
That is a very good question. That's really the question of the day because we're getting to the point where uh, somebody's probably going to have to skip some procedural steps in order to get this done in time unless there's a deal just about now. Uh, McCarthy has promised his members, the House Republicans, that they will get 72 hours to read this before a House vote. Uh, that puts us to at least Friday. There's an expectation that they could be voting on the weekend. Really, when this gets to the Senate, typically the Senate would need a week or so to pass anything unless they get unanimous consent from all 100 members to skip a procedural step. Uh, if the debt limit deadline actually does turn out to be around June 1st or 2nd or so, uh, we, we're, we'd be bumping up against that uh, unless there's a deal right now. Uh, so there's going to have to be a conversation about whether they either skip their 72-hour rule in the House or can they get uh, the most cantankerous senators to agree to skip some debate in the Senate. That's probably the more likely option, uh, and, and that will come with its own discussion about does somebody demand an amendment vote or, or what, what do you need to do to get unanimous consent in the Senate uh, to speed up consideration of this. But that's that's the conversation they're about to have. Okay, Jack, thanks very much. Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government with the latest on what any framework deal might look like and the timescales involved. Let's talk about the uh, global growth story. Eurozone manufacturing activity shrank this month at the fastest, fastest pace since the pandemic. Uh, we'll get US PMI data at 9.45 a.m. Eastern time. Joining us now to go through some of the numbers is Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. I talked a little about uh, the UK PMI earlier on, but you've got the details on that and also the Eurozone story then, Valerie. Yes, I do. And it was the fact that the manufacturing PMIs that stuck out in both the Eurozone and the UK today. In fact, in the Eurozone, the manufacturing PMI came in way below estimates, but it actually came in at a 36 month low. That's telling us that the, the weakness in German manufacturing is really having an impact on the broader region. Now, services came above expectations and still in contract and still in expansion territory. But broadly, overall, it shows us that the pace of growth eased somewhat in May for the Eurozone. But let's flip on and talk a little bit more about the UK. In the UK, both the composite, the manufacturing, and the services came in lower than estimated. And the manufacturing exactly came in lower than all estimates, and it came in especially weak. And then there was a bit of bad news for the Bank of England in here. The underlying component of prices paid increased the fastest in three months. That is not a good sign for the Bank of England when they're worried about their inflation flight fight. But buckle in, we've got the U.S. PMIs at 945 as well. And of course, a little bit more coming out from the U.S. as well. Valerie, some contrarian speak, uh, some hawkish Fed speak over the last few days. Walk us through why comments from James Bullard are such an important factor to keep in mind. Yeah, so Bullard uh, was out speaking yesterday claiming that we need more hikes and not just more hikes. He specifically said he thinks that we're in for two more hikes later this year. Exactly when he was unsure, but he wants them sooner rather than later. Look, that's not completely a surprise. We know in the dot plot there are some dots up there uh, calling for two or three more hikes this year. And Bullard is one of the most hawkish. We also heard from Keshkari. Now, I think his comment was very, was, uh, very insightful. It's important for him that it is communicated that even if we do pause in, in June in the next uh, Fed meeting, that they communicate that we're not done. And I think this is something we're likely going to hear from other Fed speakers. Uh, you know, as the year goes on, the Fed members are going to continually uh, communicate that the Fed is in a hiking bias, even if they do take one or two meetings off. All of this have seen a lot of pressure on the two-year yield. I kind of cherry-picked the date, but if you look in the exact nine days, Critty, this two-year yield has risen 45 basis points. It really makes the standout of the NASDAQ tech performance stand out even more when you see that it's been on the guise of yields higher. Okay, yeah, it certainly does. Thanks very much. Valerie Titel there with the latest on the uh, Fed language that we're hearing and the underlying growth stories that are developing globally. Now, to the Qatar Economic Forum, which is taking place in Doha. The event brings together government officials, key business leaders uh, from around the globe as they shine a light on the world's major challenges, also taking uh, a focus uh, on some of the regional issues as well. Speaking at the conference, Saudi Arabia's top energy official issued another warning to oil short sellers. I think uh, the speculators, uh, like any, we think in any market, they are there to stay. Uh, I keep advising them that they will be ouching 
they did ouch in April. Uh, I don't have to show my cards. I'm not a poker player and I don't know poker, how to play poker, but I got it from a movie somewhere. But, <laughs> but I would just tell them, watch out. Bloomberg's Manners Crowley joins us now from Zohar. I'm sure you enjoyed some of that exchange then, Manners. How ready do you think OPEC Plus are to act with cuts? They have already caused speculators to ouch, to use the, uh, the language there of the Saudi energy minister, and a warning from him about pain to come. Look, the market's very nervous, Anna, isn't it, in terms of the supply side, the China reopening narrative. I mean, that is his stock and trade phrase uh, about wanting those short sellers to ouch like hell. Now, it comes down to when you look at positioning in this market, it is dominated by huge short positions, perhaps the biggest short positions by the non-commercial part of the market since 2011. But he went on to talk in there about an uncertainty gap. We're obsessed, you, me, Fran, and the oil team from Bloomberg, about the myopia of the next one month, two months, three months. And I think he's trying to sort of say, look, our role is about fiscal discipline within the oil market on a slightly longer term trajectory. His phrase was, you know, policymakers are not daring enough in terms of the investment program. And that's part of what we're debating here at the Qatar Economic Forum. The transition, a uh, just transition from the north to the south. And what does that mean for the energy complex? He was, I would say, scathing in regards to hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, pink hydrogen. Um, you know, who's going to buy hydrogen and, and at what price? So the table is set. I mean, he may not be a poker player, but he is a man of great theatre. So there's the Royal Command has gone out. We're on our way to Vienna, another road trip to Vienna. And you can be pretty sure that that's where that piece of theatre will play out. And Bakr al-Bakr sat down with me, the CEO of the airline, Qatar Airways, and made it clear that China's reopening, it's not an easy trade. He can't scale up. That's the problem in China, Anna, is that they have bottlenecks, and so that may put a limit on demand. Ms. Edwards, good morning from Qatar. <laughs> Manis, uh, I'm going to take it from here. It's good to see you as well. Walk us through what else we can expect from the economic forum. Look, I think we're going to build up. We've heard from Victor Orban, uh, editor-in-chief. John Makerthway did that interview. There can be no peace in Ukraine without a U.S.-Russia Piece. I think that's an interesting piece. I've got the Georgian president, uh, sorry, prime minister tomorrow. Uh, so we're going to talk to him. They still haven't come on board with sanctions. They have had uh, the air routes with Russia reopened. We're going to talk a little bit more about the future of capitalism. Yes, get ready for a panel on that, doing the preparation for the future of capitalism. I mean, I deal with many existential issues in my brain on a daily basis. But, you, you know, are there existential threats to capitalism? We need a more equitable world. That's going to be MasterCard along with the, uh, the Commercial Bank of Kuwait, etc. I think there's some pretty good conversations coming up this afternoon, again, uh, around security. Uh, and the, I have never seen, there's 3,000 people due here today. I saved a few souls and I opened the door and I let them in. I just hope they repay me with kindness. <laughs> Ladies. I hope they do. Uh, some heavy subjects then on the, uh, on the agenda over there in Doha. Thanks very much to Manus Cranny for uh, giving us a, a sort of up sum of what we heard from that uh, panel on energy markets. Much more to come from the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Later this hour, we'll bring you the live panel discussion with the CEO of TikTok, plus many more conversations with global leaders at that uh, forum throughout the day on Bloomberg. We'll hear from Standard Chartered CEO Bill Winters and the Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun, among other voices. And happening right now in Doha, Bloomberg's Stephanie Flanders is speaking with Saudi Arabia's Minister of Investment. You can continue to watch that conversation and others. Uh, if you want to stick with the coverage from Doha, go to Live Go on the Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Uh, the Gulf and Asia is the future. It's very easy and is common to look at the UK as the past uh, and a country that is pushing itself perhaps further behind.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, there's something interesting going out in the market right now as we await all the kind of doom and gloom that's there, monetary policy, geopolitics, and of course, uh, the debt ceiling debate. You are seeing an interesting play in the market. It's essentially buy tech, sell bonds. At least that has been the trade on the front end of the curve for the last nine days or so. Really important to talk about this dynamic because a year ago, if you had seen higher yield uh, and higher tech at the same time, our heads would have been spinning. That inverse correlation between the bond market and the stock market just no longer exists. For our radio audience here, we're looking at a chart of NASDAQ futures and two-year yield that essentially look like one line. They are both moving higher, and it really speaks to the idea of, do, is this a kind of trade in tech actually kind of creating those bubble fears that we traditionally associate with a tech a uh, heavy rally. Uh, we're going to bring in a true expert here. Bloomer Equities editor Ksenia Galuchko joins us. Ksenia, it feels like the signs of a sustainable rally in the stock market is breath. But is a tech heavy rally, given the weighting in the S&P 500, that bad of a thing? What do you think? Yeah, it's definitely been a very, very narrow breadth of a rally this year. Uh, some experts say that it's the narrowest breadth of recovery in the U.S. stock market in 30 years because it's mainly been led by a few of these stocks that are powering the Nasdaq higher. So it's really the mega cap tech stocks that have been driving investor interest. And the main reason has been that investors are hoping for a pause in rate hikes. And at the same time, in a defensive rotation, after that financial crisis that we saw in March among municipal banks, Yes. <laughs> Uh, investors started rotating toward more defensive and stronger corporate earnings, and tech is able to offer these things to investors. Okay, of, offer strong corporate earnings also offers uh, the ability to mention AI every sentence during earnings calls, which maybe is uh, what some people seem to be trading on right now. Uh, Ksenia, let me ask you about various or divergent calls, seemingly divergent at least, calls on where stocks go from here then, because this is what we've seen over the last nine days. Uh, we can contrast perhaps what we're hearing from Morgan Stanley that's, that, that have been described being the recent rally in stocks as a bit of a head fake and Bank of America who are increasing their year-end targets. Where do you see uh, th this sort of disagreement, if it is that, falling yeah. out? So looking at the average target for the S&P 500 for the end of the year, analysts in general on average see a bit of a downside from here, about 4%. And even with this Bank of America upgrade, they only see 2.5% gain for the S&P 500 from current levels. So it's really quite muted gains from here just because we've seen such a big rally. But history shows that uh, with the S&P 500 gaining about 8 to 9% in the first 100 days, that bodes really well historically for the returns for the rest of the year. And uh, S&P 500 could gain as much as 25% this year just based on this one, first 100 days of the recovery. Obviously, lofty valuations and possible contraction in earnings are a major risk, as is the U.S. debt ceiling negotiation that is just dragging on. Mm, yes, it is. And uh, we haven't got to the end there yet, have we? Because, thank you very much, Bloomberg's Kazenia Galuchko with the latest on markets. You can get further market analysis. Check out the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. An elusive agreement. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says he and President Biden have had a productive talk but haven't yet reached a deal to avert a debt default. And a hawks rebuttal. The Fed's James Bullard and Neil Kashkari say more hikes could be needed this year days after Jerome Powell signaled a pause next month. Plus, the Qatar Economic Forum kicks off in Doha, where we'll be speaking exclusively with global leaders in business and politics. In just a few moments, we hear from the CEO of TikTok. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, a lot to digest, but perhaps the most newsmaking value happening in Doha this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Plenty coming out there from the energy markets uh, to aviation and beyond. So lots to talk about there uh, from the, the ge geopolitical front as well. So some of those con uh, conversations, global conversations, filtering their way into the uh, into the uh, conversations in Doha. Let's get to what we're seeing here on European equity markets. Then we're down by three tenths of one percent on the uh, stocks 600 right now. Pretty broad base across European equity markets, pulling back a little. Yes, we hear that the talks in. Uh, 
the United States in Washington have been productive. And yes, President Biden reassures there'll be no default, but certainly the markets can't take that possibility for granted just yet. Uh, Julius Baer is down by 7.6%, a money manager, of course, wealth management business over in Switzerland. The expectation had been that they might do a little better from the collapse of Credit Suisse. They have not uh, won big as a result of that, and so the stock down by 7.6%. The pound is at 123.93 on the back foot against the US dollar. It, that was the case earlier on this morning. Concern around the growth story, around the extent to which inflation stays sticky in the UK. We get inflation data out from the UK tomorrow. We're going to hear from uh, a number of policymakers today. We've already heard a little bit from the Bank of England governor. There are still expectations uh, that we will see further hikes here in the UK. So that's the, the Bank of England story right now. And we've got PMI data which certainly showed a, a, a lower than expected services PMI, Chrissy, but still pretty sticky on the services side. And Brent crude is pretty flat this morning, $76. But we put it in there because, of course, Chrissy, we were listening earlier on when the uh, Saudi energy minister uh, said, watch out to those speculating on oil markets. Uh, those comments coming from the Qatar Economic Forum, uh, where we are speaking exclusively to all of these guests. And he was saying this, of course, in the context of the surprise that energy markets got back in April when we saw OPEC Plus cut back on production. Yeah, similar dynamic that you are seeing uh, stateside as well, and at least in pre-market trading. I'll work from the bottom up. As you were talking about that oil story, NYMEX crude kind of unchanged right now. A 72 handle, but it looks like it's trending marginally, marginally positively. So, of course, we're going to see if any of the news coming out of Doha kind of shifts the needle a little bit on the oil markets. But the souring sentiment, Anna, that you are seeing in Europe, 100% bleeding into the U.S. pre-market session. Futures kind of tilting a little bit downwards, down about one-tenth of one percent. Again, not a major move, no major momentum or conviction just yet, but certainly something you're seeing being influenced by what you're seeing in Europe as well. A two-year yield is interesting because we were worried about it sustainably staying above that 4% level. And lo and behold, it is. 436 on that two-year yield, a move of already about five basis points to the upside. And that is a really big deal coming off of the comments yesterday from James Bullard, a known hawk, and Neil Kashkari, also a known hawk. Bullard talking about two more rate hikes this year. That is counter to the consensus of essentially a pause, uh, at least for the rest of the summer, something that Chairman Powell's comments were interpreted as saying. So something to keep in mind there. The Bloomberg dollar index in the meantime, Anna, perhaps following that yield story higher by about one-tenth of one percent on that index. Index. Okay, lots to discuss then with Mike Bell, JP Morgan Asset Management, global market strategist who joins me on set today. Mike, I, I'm, I'm torn between where to start. Do we start with the strength that we've seen in some stock markets? Uh, do we start with the debt ceiling? Do we start with the higher yield environment? All these things no doubt linked in some way. I'm going to start with the strength that we've seen in stocks. We've talked a bit about the strength in the Nasdaq in recent sessions. And I wonder if you think that continues. Uh, I mean, let's put aside the debt conversation for just a moment and assume that goes away. That might be a big assumption, but assume it goes away. Is there more left in stocks? I think, to be honest with you, there's huge uncertainty everywhere we look at the moment. If you look at the macro picture, on the one hand, you've got the business surveys that are picking up and telling you that everything's fine, recession risk's gone away. On the other hand, you've got the loan demand surveys from the bank lending surveys telling you that everything's really very bad and that we're just on the precipice of heading into a recession. And that's the case whether you look in the US or Europe. So the macro outlook's uncertain. And then what's even more uncertain in my mind is if you do get a recession, which I think is the base case, bond yields probably rally. So we see, I think, 10-year Treasury yields go down to something like 3%. But what does that do for stocks? Does it continue to support the Nasdaq? Obviously, we've seen since October bond yields down, stocks up, particularly growth stocks. Or do you revert to a more normal world where bond yields fall in a recessionary environment and stocks go down? So I think the outlook is just highly uncertain. And the way I view it is that you know, you don't have to bet big on every hand you're dealt. I think when the outlook is uncertain, it makes sense to make smaller relative bets. Uh, back in October, we were the view that we were going to get a recession, but that was fully priced in, so we were bullish. Stocks have gone up a fair bit, so we're less bullish on stocks now than we were six, seven months ago. But wouldn't want to be taking big underweight positions. Okay, either. and t taking that all on board and the fact you don't have to go overboard in every trade, what yeah. about the geographical distribution of that? appetite, however limited, for stocks? Yeah, I mean, what strikes me is that when you look at the different markets, Europe is the market that has most priced out recession risk. European stocks are pretty much back at highs, whereas back in October they were down 30%. So I think the market has got very excited about the pickup in the European PMIs, and obviously they came up a little bit this morning, but are still broadly telling you that the macro outlook is okay. 
But as I say, I look at those loan demand surveys and I look at some of the potential issues that you might get in commercial real estate, not just in the US but in Europe too. Mm. And I think it's too early to say that Europe is out of the woods. Yes, the energy problem has gone away, but so if I was having to be cautious somewhere, I'd probably want to be cautious on Europe. OK, uh, stay with us for a moment, uh, Mike. Thank you very much for thoughts so far. Mike Bell, JP Morgan Asset Management uh, with us. Let us head back out to the Qatar Economic Thanks Forum for in Doha, where Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde is in discussion with the CEO of TikTok. The bill that was recently passed is simply unconstitutional. Mm. And as you pointed out, we very recently filed a lawsuit to challenge this in the courts. And we are confident that we will prevail. Um, Separately, you know, I've noticed that some of our creators have also filed a separate lawsuit challenging the same bill in the courts. And I do want to say that, you know, they care because TikTok is really important to them. Mm. And this is the part of the story that I think is the most important part, you know, of TikTok, which is that now that we have more than 150 million Americans on our platform on a very active basis, more than a billion around the world, you know, people use TikTok as a place for expression. It's a very different experience, as you may know, from the other apps that are available in the market. You know, this is one for discovery, for expression, for free expression. And a lot of our users use TikTok to find their communities, to discover, and to express themselves. Yeah. You know, moreover, you know, there are 5 million small businesses in the United States that depend on TikTok and millions more around the world, including here in this country and in the region. So I, I think, you know, ultimately it is about providing value to these users and making sure that, you know, we continue to provide them with a great service that benefits them. And that's, um, you know, our key focus at this moment in time. Expressing oneself. Was that quite hard to express yourself most recently when you were in Congress, when you were having to try and tell your story of why TikTok is important to the United States? Uh, I, I think it was a very important process and I'm very uh, grateful for the opportunity to show up and to tell our side of the story. You know, Could you I, tell your side of the story? Uh, throughout the five hours, uh, I believe I had time to do that. Yeah. And I think it's a good opportunity for us to explain ourselves because there are some myths and misconceptions about our company out there. Uh, dig into them because the key issue that many would have is data and the concern, the anxiety that ultimately the Chinese government can have access to US user data. That is why Montana is wanting to ban TikTok. What do you wish you could have said to make that land that that isn't going to happen? Because it felt as though you didn't manage to prove that point. Well, TikTok is not available in mainland China today. Uh, as we said many times, the Chinese government has actually never asked us for US user data, and we will not provide, even if asked. Now, beyond that, we have built, over the last two years, um, something we call internally Project Texas. And what it really is, is to ensure that American data is stored on American soil by an American company and overseen by American personnel. And this is a, truly an unprecedented project that none of, our, uh, none of the other companies in our industry have ever attempted. And we believe that we have taken steps that are above and beyond what our industry has done to protect the safety of US user data, which is very important. And where are you with Project Texas? Because there's been some reporting, and I know that you've come out and said very soon Oracle will have the unprecedented access to our data or indeed to your the ways in which of your source code but that's not now when will oracle be able to enact this sort of unprecedented overseeing and transparency of, of your company uh, project texas is a very complicated project and a lot of the elements of the project is already in place and operational uh, for example today by default all us data is stored in the oracle cloud service already in the oracle cloud infrastructure and no longer in our own service in Virginia and in Singapore. You've already done that transfer? It's already done by default, correct. Um, separately, Oracle has begun the, source, the, the review of the code, although it's, uh, as you can understand, you know, a complicated project that will take time for us to finish the details. So it's on track. Oracle and ourselves are working together with the US government to finalize the details of Project Texas. There's also, I believe, Project Clover in Europe which is a similar idea, and 
What's so interesting is your industry is grappling with this issue at the moment. The fact that we're sort of almost getting a nationalization, a sovereignty argument for data. And we've just seen Meta, which I know the artist formerly known as Facebook, where you were once an intern, has just been issued a fine for keeping its data in Europe or not, as the case may be. That's what's argued by the EU regulators. What do you make of this almost deglobalization that's occurring in technology? I think you, this is a very important uh, topic that you are uh, you're touching on. Now, on the one hand, the internet is really built on this idea of global interoperability. And, the, I, and the, this idea that talent from around the world can connect very seamlessly mm. with each other. And I think we've all seen the benefits of a very connected global internet over the last few decades. And I continue to be a big proponent of that. I think there's so many important elements of this global interoperability that needs to be preserved. Now, at the same time, um, there are conversations now in the EU, in, in the US, and in other countries around the world about what they call data sovereignty, you know, making sure that there are certain elements of the data. You know, data is a very big term, so mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we are very specific about what we are talking about. You know, certain elements of protected data, for example, are stored and handled in a particular way in each um, region. And that's something that I believe we are ahead of the curve, because Project Texas in the United States is really sort of a project that deals with digital sovereignty in the US. And because we have so much learning from that project, uh, we started Project Clover, a very, very similar project for Europe, um, starting a few uh, months ago now. And the idea is very similar. You know, we are building our data centers in Ireland, in Norway, localizing the storage of data in Europe, you know, building um, additional data access protocols, but adapted for GDPR, which mm -hmm. is the regulation within, within the EU. And uh, we believe that this is an important conversation and we are slightly ahead of the curve. And I think that, you know, we need to simultaneously address the concerns about, you know, and the desire for digital sovereignty while making sure that we don't break the internet, that we don't balkanize this and we continue to enjoy the benefits of a seamlessly connected global internet. Do you think that argument can land? And in particular, do you think there's a point at which you're going to be able to turn to US Congress or an EU regulator and say, without doubt, there will be no backdoor to any government, whether it be the Chinese government or never wants to have their data? Like one previous, well, employee of ByteDance is currently saying does exist, a backdoor does exist for the Chinese government. Uh, I just want to address uh, that particular person left the company in 2018. Uh, so a lot of what he said is baseless in, in our, from our point of view. Uh, but to your question, I think the, you know, security, data security is a never ending project. You know, any company that comes to you and says, we are 100% safe from any threats is probably underestimating the problem because threats can exist externally and internally, domestic or foreign. You know, this is, uh, this is true for any company that deals with, you know, data at some scale. So what we commit to is that we will take this extremely seriously, that we will continue to invest to make sure that our data is as safe as possible. Mm. But to ask any company to promise that, you know, this is 100% safe from all threats, I think this is not something that any company can reasonably promise. Project Clover and Project Texas, we believe, are unprecedented pro uh, projects that we're putting in place that will allow the data to not only be stored locally, but to be managed by local employees, and to, be, and to have third party local companies to give that, um, uh, to give that system you know, its um, monitoring. And this is something that goes above and beyond that any company in our industry has pursued so far. Mm -hmm. So we're confident that this is a very robust solution. And you're using technology to try and fix a perceived problem. Where could artificial intelligence be used for moderation as well as for content creation and news ways in which your creators can be producing video that much faster, for example? Uh, the recent coverage on AI reminds me of this great quote that says um, something along the lines of, it took me 10 years to be an overnight success. <laughs> so the, the industry has been developing and evolving for a very significant period of time. And uh, we have incorporated some elements of machine learning, for example, in our recommendation algorithm. Our recommendation algorithm is just math. 
Yeah. And in order to pr pr process all these numbers across so many users, uh, we need to leverage machine learning. So it, it is at the core of the offering that we are giving to our users, and it's good. You know, people discover a lot of joyful content because of our recommendation algorithm. Now, beyond that, uh, some of the latest developments, particularly by, by OpenAI and you know, the ChatGPT product, is, um, could be very profound for productivity. Um, there are many elements like content moderation um, or creation as a creation tool for many of our users on our platform that could be unlocked with this new technology. It's, it's very exciting. I just want to go to our audience because you have control within this conversation. You can partake in a poll, for example. I want to put to you a question currently that we're wondering as to whether artificial intelligence will change the way in which you use social media in all its forms. Yes, it will be vastly changing your relationship with social media. You'll be making avatars left, right and center. Maybe you already think AI is within the world of social media and it's already being leveraged. Or do you not think it'll change at all? I'm going to give you a moment to get into your app, give me your answer. But to that point, your own AI, you mentioned open AI there. Would you ever build your own large language model at TikTok? Would it be beneficial? I think it's um, a very interesting development in the industry. And of course, there are many companies that are leading in this. And we're still in the process of making sure that we understand and study this. Mm -hmm. So that's the stage that we are at at this moment in time. Okay, being debated. There's a lot of optimism and hope around artificial intelligence. There's also a lot of caution and concern. How do you regulate it? How do you look at ensuring that this doesn't make people out of work? Or indeed, how do we ensure that perhaps the AI effects that I can use within TikTok doesn't make everyone think that anyone can be beautiful, anyone can be glamorous. I'm thinking of one particularly uh, famous AI filter that you have, Glamour Filter. You are, I know, a man who thinks a lot about ensuring safety on the product. You're a man of two children who are eventually going, their world is created around technology. How's, how safe and secure and, and built for a healthy relationship with technology, do you think TikTok is? This is a very important uh, question. I, I think not only for us, but for people that will come after us. Um, the progress, the current progress of AI is truly very exciting. It's, it's fascinating. And from everything that we have seen so far, it could really quite profoundly improve our productivity across many, many things as a great tool for us to make our daily lives and our daily work a lot better, including the creation of videos. You know, TikTok is about inspiring creativity and bringing joy. And you can imagine, you know, using some of these creation tools for people to express themselves in a better way than before. You know, one part of our product vision is a canvas to create. You know, we have a window to discover, a canvas to create, and bridges to share. Now, on the creation part, you know, if we give people more tools, I think you can imagine a world where it's easier for people to express themselves. So that's, that's very exciting. Uh, what you mentioned is you know, the, the risks. You know, as with anything that's evolving so quickly, you know, of course you know, we should invest to understand the risks. And I think for AI, because it's so broad and so dynamic at this moment in time, you know, um, it is important that we understand the, um, what the technology can do. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you know, it's very hard to put guardrails on something we don't understand. Um, so yes, you know, I, I do agree that some form of thoughtful, careful regulation is necessary to make sure that we're building guardrails, but at the same time, not killing off the innovation on something that could be so exciting for all of us. And people are excited. Look, particularly when it comes to AI within social media, they think it will change social media. A lot, 73% of those in the audience do think that. How often at the moment, as the CEO of TikTok that is owned by a Chinese company. Are people asking you about regulation in China of AI vis-a-vis -vis in the US or globally in the Middle East, in Europe? I, I think these are important uh, questions. You know, we are still studying them across the world uh, that TikTok operates in. Um, but uh, it's still very early. You mm. know, I, I personally think that uh, it could be a mixture of rules and transparency and disclosure. Because for something that's evolving so quickly, um, a lot of times it is you put in some guardrails and it could be quickly outdated, you know, um, because of the evolution of the technology. So uh, asking companies to be very forthcoming 
with disclosure to be very transparent about what they're building could be a very good way for us to better understand where the industry is headed. Transparency, disclosure, a lot of what you're advocating to make people feel comfortable with TikTok, whether it be in Europe or the US. Are you, do you have a plan B if you're banned in any state or country? Now, we believe that, you know, for an app that serves so many people uh, around the world, that is so deeply impactful, not only on expression, but on people's ability to connect. You know, mm. I hear so many stories. Uh, right before my hearing, I, I, got, a, I got a very nice um, message from one of our creators. Um, he's given me permission to talk about him. His name is Dylan Walker. And he told me that he lives with autism. And um, because of our platform, he has found his voice through music to connect with a community that he could not connect with before. And it's, it's this kind of connections, you know, th this deeply impactful, um, positive impact that our product has on people that gives me a lot of confidence that we can have very thoughtful conversations with regulators around the world. And I'm confident that we are here to stay, um, you know, not only because of the investments they were putting in to keep the platform safe, but because of the, the impact it's having on the users themselves. You've got two kids. Do you think they will come on and would you be happy with them to interact with technology in the way that we do now as a society? I think it's very important for the next generation to be digitally, digitally savvy because they are going to live in that world. So, I mean, I don't want to speak for all parents. I think it's very important that parents make their individual decisions with their, with their children. But for me personally, I'm very comfortable with my children getting more involved with uh, understanding technology at an early age. And using a TikTok product from 13 onwards, do you think? Yes, absolutely. Ultimately, do you feel at the moment when it comes to the creator that you've become, 3.8 million followers that you have on TikTok and the like, are you able to express yourself there? Are you seeing, feeling any vulnerability there of your newfound fame? <laughs> well, um, I, I think it's very fun um, to be able to uh, express myself like that. And uh, I've been playing around with, you know, a lot more sophisticated video editing. By the way, every single video that I post is, uh, you know, that I, I go through the editing myself. Um, it's, it's very fun. And it's very, I think it's, it gives me a sense of, a, a stronger sense of community with our, with our uh, creators and our users. Um, I do interact with them on the app as well. It's been fantastic. And I see you are on as well. So <laughs> for those who are not following, please follow her. <laughs> well, vice versa to you, I have a few Slightly fewer followers than you, it must be said, but I do all the editing myself too. <laughs> Cho, it was great to have some time with you. It went far too fast. We really appreciate you being here. Thank Cho you very Chu much. of TikTok, the CEO. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde there speaking with the CEO of TikTok at the Qatar Economic Forum. Uh, plenty in that conversation, ending there talking about his own social media influence. Uh, but starting it, Chrissy, really interesting, talking about his experience on Capitol Hill regulation, where they're seeing pushback, of course, uh, from some states in the United States and how that uh, sort of uh, that, that, that dynamic is going. Also, data protocols from Project Texas to Project Clover here in Europe. Lots to discuss there. Uh, interesting, he, he pushes back against the what he says is balkanization of regulation. I suppose these are conversations we're going to have with lots of big tech businesses um, as you try and match big tech, global big tech, on top of um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the national regulatory environment. Yeah, and it's interesting that we're talking about this in the context of TikTok specifically because there is also that overlay of geopolitics when it comes to TikTok. But Anna, these are the same questions that you see when it comes to the likes of Facebook, uh, Meta, uh, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, you name it. That's all really important when it comes to essentially how you start to regulate not just TikTok specifically, but social media around the world and get everyone on the same page. So uh, this is really important again when we talk about just what we're doing in terms of not just social media for our children and etc but also uh, when you talk about just how this is going to play into the market specifically remember a lot of these social media companies have been driving the gains uh, when you look at mm. the stock market uh, as well I mean meta for example their gear of efficiency uh, is a really big part of this year's stock market story 
Yeah, and interesting, they talked about AI. To what extent has that been as a theme driving resurgent interest in, in the NASDAQ and in tech stocks broadly? You, you, you mentioned earlier on in the programme, Chrissy, that relationship we've seen between uh, the NASDAQ rising despite the fact that we've got this higher yield environment, which for, in some periods has, has not been the case. Um, we've got U US stock futures pointing down, but not hugely so, still waiting for any movement in Washington. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to the stalemate that you're seeing, but I wonder what the, the reaction is going to be. Let's say we do have a deal come through. Will it be something to celebrate, or does the narrative very quickly shift to the hawkish monetary policy we're hearing from the likes of James Bullard, Neil Kashkari, and I wonder who else will come to the forefront? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we've got the debt ceiling debate to, to nail down, but then, of course, there's the Fed conversation, which will carry on. Interesting that we didn't necessarily see so much pickup on some of those uh, Fed lines over the last uh, few days or so. Maybe they get more airtime once we're done talking about the uh, uh, done talking about the debt ceiling. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is up ahead. There'll be plenty more, no doubt, coming from Doha. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>